Welcome to You're the Boss event. My name is Joni Fetters, and on behalf of the team here, I want to welcome you to Aileron. So I know we have some uh, tried and true visitors who've been here 50 plus times, and we have some brand new people here. So uh, welcome to the campus, welcome to Aileron. Our mission here is to unleash the potential of privately held businesses through professional management, ultimately to raise the quality of life in America. And our focus every day then as a community here is to really help each other solve problems, uh, grow profitable businesses for the future, create sustainable businesses, help the business community thrive. Uh, because through the survey, you could see a lot of us shared those common challenges, thoughts on our minds, um, and really the hope that we can keep uh, providing a community that thrives. Last year, we had the opportunity to introduce a, a book. Um, and we got Clay and a lot of people from Aileron and a lot of what we learned from business owners. And it's in a book called Run Your Business, Don't Let It Run You. And we had the opportunity to go do a media tour because we have one of the most fantastic PR pre people, I think, in the country. Um, and we got to go to New York. And that's a pretty big deal for us to, to leave Tip City and to, to enter into the New York City. And we got to meet with Forbes and we got to meet with um, Fox Business News and Entrepreneur.com. And, and it was wonderful. It was a great day. Um, but we had an opportunity to sit down at the New York Times. And so we walk in, Clay and I, and we get to sit down with a gentleman named Lauren Feldman. And oh, we switched seats, so yes, Lauren <laughs> Feldman. <laughs> Over there. And it took on a different feel. The, 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 the meeting wasn't about why'd you write the book, what's in it, you know, what can I tell for my story. His passion was about understanding the small business owner. And so his questions were more about what are they facing, what's the issues, um, where, where do they get their information? How do they help each other? What are they trying to solve today? And that was the whole conversation. And you could tell very clearly that Lauren had a mission, um, and that was within the New York Times. He really wanted to start to give some real estate to the small business owner issues um, within, that, within that environment. And uh, to the point where I know he's been fighting through some different uh, avenues to get the space uh, for the small business owner. He's also started a blog um, and got many people involved in blogs. So if you, if you follow him and you watch some of this, you see it. But his passion was to go out and get real business owners to blog about real business issues. And Jay is one of those business uh, bloggers. And Jay comes with 35 years plus of uh, owning a business. I think he started in 1978. Um, we had the opportunity to go to dinner with Jay, and they both sat in the Course of Presence, which many of you know is where you get started a lot of times here, kind of sitting down with peers and starting to talk through what professional management it is. So they sat through that to listen uh, with the promise they weren't going to publish anything secret out in the New York Times this morning, uh, which I, I didn't read anything, so I think we're all safe. So far. Yeah, so far. Um, but Jay, on the same note, was just as passionate as Lauren about what's going on with you and how do we help each other? How do we share this information? How do we get the real information out there so that you guys can read about it and, and get access that way? So that's where we saw this opportunity for them to come. I had dinner with this group last night. We had the opportunity to do it. And I think one thing that Jay really prided himself on is he speaks English, Yiddish, and entrepreneur. <laughs> so he's bilingual, trilingual, something like that, right? So, so I think we're good. So, so the format today is going to be to give them the platform for about 30, 35 minutes. Let them share what they've been conversing about and, and studying for the last you know, few years and, and bring some of that to the table. And then we're going to open up the floor based um, and also ask you to participate and ask some questions and uh, be able to converse for about an hour um, and talk about it. They've taken the survey results, so thank you very much for participating in that, they've taken those and tried to weave some of that into their conversation, but if there isn't something that's addressed, raise your hand and let's get it on the table. So it's meant to be a conversation, it's meant to be about issues that you're facing and uh, get some experience from what Jay's experienced as a business owner and Lauren's learned from other business owners. So with that, I'll turn the floor to you. Thank you, Joni. Uh, what a nice introduction. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I've been at the New York Times for about five years now. Before that, I was at Inc. Uh, for about six or seven years. Uh, when I was at Inc., I learned two really important things. Uh, one was that business owners don't like to be told how to run their business by 24-year-old reporters working for money-losing publications. <laughs> Some people think that way. Um, I didn't really understand it, but I took it to heart. 
And when I went to the Times, I convinced them that what we needed to do was to get the voice of actual business owners into the publication, that um, there was no substitute, you can't filter it. We do have journalists who cover small business issues, but uh, the You're the Boss blog is written primarily by business owners like Jay, who write about their own ups and downs, what it's like in the trenches. And um, we found that to be much more effective than relying on the 24-year-old uh, reporters. The second thing I learned there was uh, to listen to what this guy has to say and keep him as close as possible. Um, I gave him a blog at Inc. He'd, he'd been uh, the subject of a cover story that I edited while I was at Inc. And uh, we brought him into the office for kind of a Q&A session. And I realized that I learned more about what it's really like for a small business owner in five minutes listening to him than I had in the previous five years at Inc. So I gave him a blog there. And when I went to the Times, I brought him uh, along. And um, we've tried to build a community where we have a conversation back and forth with uh, business owners. Um, like you, uh, in the hope that we can all learn something uh, along the way. I, I think I'm very fortunate that when Jay got started, there was no fabulous organization like this one, because if there had been and he had been a part of it, he might not have made all the mistakes he made getting started with his business, and he wouldn't be nearly as good a blogger today as he is. So we're lucky Aileron didn't come along too soon. Um, good for you. <laughs> And that's, and that's what matters, right, Jay? Absolutely. Um, Jay uh, has never had a real job. He uh, got out of school and immediately started a uh, picture framing business, which he claims is the largest picture There's framing no shop. claiming in the here. I'm, it's the largest custom picture framing shop. How do you know that? Because I go all over the world and people tell okay, me. Okay, it's the largest picture framing shop there we go. in the world. New York Times said so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the record, we don't have fact checkers. Um, <laughs> Jay, I know you like to say that there are uh, three stages of starting and building a business and that you experienced all of them. What are those three stages? From my experience and from looking at other people, there's the startup, which go, could go on for a year or two or three, whatever and then it moves into the throw-up stage, <laughs> which those of you that are in business know what I'm talking about, and then you move into the grow-up stage. What was, uh, what was your startup stage like? The startup stage is, you know, now everybody thinks it's the new idea, but in reality, a lot of the times, it's just you think you do a better job. I went into the picture framing business because I liked it, I'd done it in high school and college, and I thought I could do a better job with it because what I saw was out there was slow delivery, mediocre selection, and mediocre service. So. I thought I could make a living at it. This was 1978. Entrepreneurship was not a word that was being used back then. And, and I didn't get any big send off. When I graduated with an accounting degree, everybody said to me, you're going to waste your degree? I heard that a hundred times. And, and not I, just from your mother, right? No, my mother went to the next step. I went, came home one day and it was extremely stressful. It really was. I didn't know what to do. Should I go into business? This is what, wasn't what you were supposed to do in 1978. You were supposed to go to law school. And I came home and I said, Mom, I decide I'm going to go into the picture framing business. She, she took a big sigh and said, ah, you went to school for four years and you ended up like your father. <laughs> and I can't even tell you it bothered me. I was so numbed already from hearing it from everyone else. I figured, whatever. And I went into business and business grew like crazy for, for you know, adult, the first year I did $120,000, which back in 1978 was a lot of business. The next year I did two forty. dollars the average frame shop in America today does $180,000 a year. I was doing 240 my second year in, in, in 19. How do you explain that? Uh, because it, it, the irony is I worked in my father's dime store. Anyone know what a dime store is? The wood floor, the tin ceiling, my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunt, my uncle, my father. I grew up from when I was five years old taking care of customers. I didn't know any different. And that was a complete 180 degrees from what the typical picture frame shop was. They were, they were artists, and you'll get it when they're ready. And call me, we'll see if it'll be done. I took care of customers. I just was always customer driven. I was customer driven before that phrase was really popular. And I always worked hard to have the better, better selection and better people. 
and it grew real fast. I moved into the throw-up stage for, frankly, 15 years of being out of control. I, I, did, I never managed anyone. I never hired anybody. And I went through 15 years of, I wasn't mentored, I was tortured. I mean, hiring, firing, hiring, firing, problems, delivering, it's apologizing. And it was extremely stressful and extremely time consuming to say the least. And um, that went on for probably 15 years until I finally caught up to myself. I mean, now I have 110 employees and I have less grief today by far than when I had five employees. I mean, there's no comparison. I actually have a life now. I can actually come in when I want, leave when I want, and, it, and it's somewhat running itself. Right blog post for me. Right, exactly. Uh, and, and in between, it just took me a lot of years to figure out, you know, how are you supposed to run a business? And the biggest shock was, which I try to help people with regularly, is there's no job description for the boss. <laughs> and people just don't understand what being the boss is. And that's a huge problem. So what was... What got you from the throw-up stage to the grow-up stage? What was the trigger? Survival. I had no choice but to figure it out. And slowly but surely, I figured out all the basics of business that in my world, or I think in most people's businesses, 80% of management's hiring the right people in the first place. And the irony to that is, I ask, I, you know, I'll do a class with 100 people. How many have had a class in uh, hiring? Like one hand goes up, if any hand goes up. The most basic, important thing in business they don't teach in college, I don't believe, in most cases. So hiring is critical, and then figuring out the whole management piece. Well, let's talk about it. How do you hire the right people? Do, do you do interviews yourself? Um, I'm the last one to interview. What I've learned is about myself and about most entrepreneurs, the entrepreneur, by definition, is probably the worst person to be doing the interviewing. Now you'd think, well wait, it's their business. They should care more about it. They should, be, they should know what they need better. But, but think about it. What do most entrepreneurs have in common that are successful? They like people. Kind of hard to be in business and not you know, f like people. When you're interviewing, you need to be skeptical. Guilty until proven innocent. I mean, you really need to be skeptical and listen. Two, let's talk about the listening part. They love their businesses. They love the mission they're on. They want to tell everybody about it. So they spend a lot of time during the interview talking about, you know, we're really into taking care of customers. And this is, and, and then they, are you into taking care? Oh, yeah, perfect. He's into taking care of customers. And they kind of feed half the answers to the applicant. And lastly, entrepreneurs have 20 other things they're supposed to be doing. So it's very easy to rationalize. Oh, yeah, he'll be great and just want to be done with it. The reality is, probably only 10% of the people you interview are gonna be great employees. And that takes time to, to, to sort through those, those 10 people or five people, whatever it takes to get to, to the right one. But three of them are nightmare employees. I mean, think about it. The pool of applicants is filled with nightmare employees because they keep losing their job. I mean, so, so three of them are nightmare employees. Three of them are just mediocre. I'm not looking for mediocre employees. And three of them, might be great employees, but just not for you. They're, they're, not, they're not right for your industry, they're not right for your location, they're not, not right for your personality, which means you really have to go into it with the idea that only one out of 10 are gonna be a, a, the, the great hire. So what was the big change that improved things at your place? How did you go from? Um, my revelation was 15 years ago or so, I interviewed a woman who was running a lighting show and she had five employees and I said to her, how many people did you have to hire to get to these five good employees? She said five, and I, I laughed. I said, either you have much lower standards than I have, or you're some kind of hiring goddess. And I hired her. She was a hiring goddess. Um, she left about 10 years ago. She moved to Oregon, and I still had most of the people she hired. She was way better at it than I was. I would interview with her, and the person would leave, and she'd turn to me and say, hey, what do you think? I would, yeah, they seem pretty good. Are you out of your mind? And she would give me 10 reasons why they, and she was right. I mean, I realized there are some people that are much better at interviewing than others. And from my experience and the experience of others, I'll blame this on someone else that, that said this, he said women are better at interviewing. Guys are so used to BSing them, each other, they don't even know they're doing it anymore. <laughs> that that, that I, th I used to have, I'd have the holiday party, and my wife would come by, and she'd meet my new production manager, I'm not exaggerating. I went through like 10 production managers over a two-year period because I just didn't get it. And she'd say, you really think that guy's going to work out? And then what would I say is the guy? Anyone got a clue? Well, why don't you just take over the company? You seem to know better than I do. You met him for five minutes and already you figured out he's not going to work out. She was right. <laughs> she was right every single one of those times. I think there are some people that are innately better at interviewing and it would be good for the business owner to recognize that if that's the case and have them do the first interview. So I'm not the first interview anymore. I'm, and, and I've gotten better at it. My, my hiring percentage used to probably be 
40% would work out. Now, if I did it on my own, I probably got it up to 70. But there are people that got it to 90, and you should find those people. You can hire those people. There are people that do it for a living that you can hire out. You have to make a good hire there, too, though. Exactly. You have to find someone that, you, you know, you, that has good recommendations from someone else. And, but there are people that are very good at hiring. Do you check references? Absolutely. And I, I hear all but the time. But nobody gives references anymore. That's just not true. They, plenty of people give references. Most people give references. And, and my argument is this. Nine out of ten times, yeah, it's a waste of time. They'll either just say something good or you can't get anything out of them worthwhile. That one out of ten time is worth making a hundred reference calls. Because if you've ever had a nightmare employee, if you could go back in time and not hire them, you would do anything possible. It's certainly worth making ten phone calls. I would never hire somebody without checking references. And I have absolutely had people tell me stuff on the reference that was just like, Wow. You know, one guy said to me, oh, yeah, that guy, he's a drug dealer. I fired him because he was dealing drugs. <laughs> oh, who would say that? Somebody without a lawyer, apparently, you know. <laughs> but he told me that. Or I called a guy one time and he says, I asked a couple questions and he says, I'd rather not elaborate. Hmm, <laughs> there's encouragement. <laughs> so she was coming in for another interview and I said to her, I said, you know, I'm a little concerned. Your reference said he didn't want to elaborate when I asked him a question. And she blurts out, I'm difficult to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Great, when can you start? Because, you know, I'm, I'm looking for more people that are difficult. So you can absolutely get things from reference calls. Not making reference calls, it's an easy excuse to say no one, no one, no one will tell you anything. It's lazy, it's, irresp it's irresponsible to yourself and to your other employees and to your customers. I would not hire some and if, and if somebody can't come up with somebody that they can get as a reference, there's something wrong. That's Is there a, a strategy to asking questions of somebody who doesn't really want to tell you? You, the truth. you can kind of the, the joke is you can kind of tell from just the way um, you can tell by the silence. Oh, Bob Smith, silence, not good. Uh, what can you tell me? What, what do you want to know? You know, and it's like pulling teeth. And then finally, you go. You know, you sound like I do when I don't want to give out a good reference, but I don't have anything good to say. And then you get one or two reactions. Either they laugh, like you caught me, or no, 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 no. To be honest, it's been five years. I had a couple of Bobs working for me. I, I'm really, I, I can't tell you. I remember them well. You can flush through that stuff. People don't want to generally lie. They don't. And, and they're not, here's my big question, will you rehire them? Anybody who fired someone that they want will not let those words come out of their mouth. It's not happening. So they're not going to go, oh, sure, I'd hire them again. They'll, well, uh, it's against our company policy. And I go, what if it wasn't against your company policy? <laughs> I mean, there are ways of getting, the, does, does it work every time? Absolutely not. But I got to tell you, it helps your odds dramatically. So if I had any tip for hiring, that would be one of them. Check references. And then how many references have I given out in 35 years? I've had hundreds of employees. I think three people have called me. People don't, people don't call references. And the last Are one. Are you willing to give well, an honest here was reference? My last, here was the typical perfunctory reference call. The guy calls me and he tells me he's interviewing one of my ex salespeople that I fired. First of all, did he ask me, did I fire her? No. He says, oh, she's got a, I'm in the, I'm in the art business, I'm in the framing business, I'm in the furniture business. She was trying to sell art but not succeeding. And he said, uh, Oh, she's, she's really good. She's got a lot of designer contacts. And he goes on and on and on. First of all, the first thing I said when he called, I said, oh, she's really nice. Tip. When someone blurts something out nice, you're trying to get off. The, oh, she's really nice. That's all I had to say. He then goes into all the designer contacts. Does he once ask me, does she have designer contacts? She says she, he doesn't ask me anything. And the interview finishes, okay, great, nice talking to you. That was the whole, that was the whole reference call. He thinks he got a good reference. All I said is she's nice. And he filled in all the blanks for himself. And then he hung up and felt like, okay, I got a good reference for her. If he had said to you, did you fire her, what would you have said? Um, I would have said, yeah, she wasn't hitting the sales numbers. If, I mean, if I would have told the truth. Does she have designer? She has some. I mean, I would have tried to evade it a little bit, but like, you know, read between the lines. I guess that's the key. Read between the lines. Nobody's going to want to say, oh, she didn't work that hard or she couldn't find. But no one wants to say that. Read between the lines. Um, I like the references, oh, she's great, you should hire her, I really miss her, I'm sorry she moved. Those are the great references. Um, again, it's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than not calling. All right, so we've talked about what you had to learn about hiring. Did you have to learn anything about firing? Um, I had to learn that firing, and this is where the hype comes in. You read all these stories of all these successful businesses, and all the CEOs stand on the stage and say, my success is because of my great team and all that stuff. They never really tell you the truth, which is, here's the truth. Every great company fires people. 
it's part of it's just part of what it is. You hire people that can't do the job, unwilling, unable, or just unexplainable. You know what those are? Where they do stuff and you think, wow, why would someone do that? I mean, that's just the way life is. If you can't accept the fact that you need to fire people, you really shouldn't be the boss. And you're not doing your customers. And, and, and then there's people who think, I'll do my speech and they'll say to themselves, oh, I can't be like, I'm too nice. And I, I tell them now, don't kid yourself. It's not that you're so nice, because I'm nice. My turnover's next, my turnover's less than 10%. I have employees, my employees have been with me for 10 years on the average, nine, 10 years. My turnover's very low, I'm nice. But they mix up nice with being a good boss, and those aren't the same thing. And, and when they say they're too nice, I go, no, it's really just that you're a wimp. I mean, let's, let's be realistic. You're just not being the boss. So I've had to learn running a business, you have to drive the business. And it's like driving a car. And the analogy I use is most people know who Mario Andretti is, right? Famous race car driver. He, he drives the car. Who knows who Ron Turcotte is? One person out of the whole room. Ron Turcotte was the, the jockey for Secretariat, probably the greatest horse ever in horse racing. But almost no one knows who he is because you can ride. the A horse is a God-given talent. It's, it's bred. A horse runs. And there's probably a lot of other jockeys that could have rode Secretariat and still won. But businesses are not horses. They're more like cars. You have to drive the car. They're not gonna drive, you can't ride a business. You gotta drive a business. And I've learned when you're the boss, there's no teamwork in losing money. Hashtag, you're the boss. You're the boss. There's no, there's no, there's no teamwork in losing money. When you're the boss, it's your responsibility to drive the car. And I don't care how many support staff you have, you have to drive the car. And in my stage of business, I've got other people that I'm teaching how to drive the car, and, it, and, and, and it's working. They're, they're taking responsibility for it. But you can't just have a great, there's no such thing as a great business without a great boss. I've never seen that. I don't think it's possible. It has to be driven. So you can't just sit back and go, oh, well, I'm too nice. I just, oh, I don't really like to do that. Oh, I can't fire anyone. Oh, I don't want to do that. You can't run a business like that. You have to drive it. So if you rate your employees on a scale of 1 to 10, how many sixes do you have working for you? Um, I contend that the sixes kill a business. The four, out of zero to 10, the fours don't kill the business because even the biggest wimp boss will fire the four. They don't come in, they're drunk, whatever. It's the sixes where we say, and I've used all of these lines, I call them the hymns of mediocrity. We say things like, well, they're trying hard. Customers really don't care how hard someone's trying. It's, they gotta get the job done. Oh, they've been here a long time. That is a painful, horrible thing to deal with, but I've had to deal with that, and every other successful business owner I know has to deal with that. When you grow, you outgrow people, unfortunately. Um, well, they're my sister, that's a problem. I mean, people have relatives <laughs> working for them. Uh, I, I've said this one, well, we could do worse. Yeah, they haven't murdered anybody, we could do worse. There's lots of excuses to keep the, second, the sixes because they're kind of getting the job done, but they're kind of not. And I don't believe there's a nobility in keeping those people because it's not fair to the other employees. It's certainly not fair to your customers, and it's not fair to your bottom line. So I have, out of 110 employees, I have a few tens. I got lots of nines. I've got 78s, and I've got uh, probably 10 sevens, but I, I certainly don't have any sixes. If you're struggling with one of those sixes, is there some key that tells you the time has come? Yeah, I use this to this day, all the way up to the vice president, which I have had to fire. It's a very simple test for myself. I say to myself, if they walked in tomorrow and quit, what would my visceral reaction be? Relief? And, it's a very, and I ask my other manager when we're talking about someone, I go, let me ask you, if they quit tomorrow, would you be relieved? And if they go, no, not really. Okay, we're going to work on it some more. But then they'll come into me one day or myself will go, you know what, at this point I'd be relieved if they quit. I think that's a good take your emotions out of a test. You shouldn't have people that when they quit you should, you're relieved. You should be disappointed every single time. And there isn't one, all right, maybe there's one. There's one. Out of 100, there's 109 people I have, if they quit, I, I wouldn't be relieved at all. I'd be disappointed they were leaving. And I got one who's, let's say, on the bubble. I'm not sure they're going to work out. To some extent, taking all this together, I think what you're talking about is having made the move from working in the business to working on the business. Would, would yes, you describe that's it that an way? old phrase, and I've, I've, the problem with that was, I think everyone tries to work on the business, but you keep getting like Al Pacino and one of the Godfathers. I get pulled back in. I mean, you're making some progress, and you get pulled back in. I mean, 
This is what I figured out. I figured it out about 15 or 20 years ago. It has served me extremely well. And I don't usually share this one, but I will. It's called PBS. I've been authorized to say what PBS means. Anyone can guess? Paralyzing bullshit. <laughs> Here's the way it works. It's very simple. Is that old expression, shit happens? There's going to be, st one of the keys to, to business is stuff's going to happen. You have to deal with it. That's the bottom line. You have to deal with it. But there's other stuff that's just bullshit that shouldn't happen. And here's my four categories. And once I figured this out, I don't step back anymore. We keep moving forward. One is what I already talked about, keeping people that can't do the job. You will continually work harder. Put, you know, there's an old expression, you're putting fires out all day long. Get rid of the arsonists. That's the key. So if you've got people that can't do the job, ooh, I feel a tweet coming. <laughs> Done. Whew, OK. You're, if you have people that can't do the job, you have engineered the business to be a, a constant pain. That's one. Two is you've all agreed on something like uh, a customer didn't pay you, you went to their credit, you know, everyone's supposed to have a credit uh, application and they didn't have one, and you say, we should never give credit out again without a signed credit app. Everyone agree? Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're never going to give credit without a signed credit app. And then it's a month, or, or safety glasses. Uh, we're we're going to have safety glasses near the sauce because someone got, some, whatever the deal you came up with, everyone agreed, yeah, we need to wear safety glasses, we need to get signed credit apps, we need to check the back door before we lock up, whatever it is. There's things that everyone agrees, yeah, we need to do it every single time. And then someone doesn't do it. And then you have another credit problem, and they didn't, that's just bullshit. I mean, you're supposed to agree and do it. So that's two. Three is people are, are not, um, F covering for each other. You know, why didn't they get that, oh, she was off that day? Well, someone's supposed to cover for them when they're off. People are supposed to play well together and work with each other and cover. And the last one is, and this, is, this can be a painful one, but it's keeping people that are defensive. I've worked with them, and lots of times I fixed it, but there's sometimes you can't fix it, and I, don't, I haven't been able to manage people that no matter what you bring up, they get on the defense, and it just wastes a lot of energy. And I have succeeded in getting people to go, there's no reason to get defensive. I just asked you, blah, blah, blah. But keeping defensive people, I have found you can't manage it. So my contention is, if you do those four things, 80% of the problems go away. And then you'll be left with, the roof is leaking and uh, you know your delivery guy got into an accident or something that you can't control but you're not going to have those ongoing same deja vu problems over and over and over again and and I can tell you I can actually go for like a month without a problem quote unquote and it used to be I couldn't go a week I couldn't go a day without a problem so it, it works at least it's worked for me so as we've heard you have the largest picture framing shop in America, a, a very substantial business, 100 employees, but you don't have a $100 million business, I don't think. Was there a time? I mean, every, a lot of people talk about that. That seems to be the magic goal. When I was, was in that, my, yeah, was in my early 20s, I just wanted to make a living. And then by 30, you know, I had, I don't know, a three, $4 million business. And I was a kid. I was written up in Forbes, you know, biz kid. And I thought, wow, nothing's going to stop me. And I thought, I was gonna have a hundred million dollar business and I found out it's not quite as easy as it looks and someone said something really smart to me. I was probably 32, he was pushing 50 and he said, Jay, everyone gets to a point in their life they realize they have limitations. And the 32 year old hotshot said to himself, that's pathetic, I don't have any limitations. That was the truest thing I ever heard. I don't have the head to run a hundred. I don't have the stomach for the cre for, for for taking on the risk. I don't have the head. I don't. Ha I don't have the head to do it. But here's the good news: it's okay. This is what I figured out. I figured out that a lot of those people that drive to get to the hundred million dollar businesses go broke. I see it all the time, or are miserable. I see it all the time. They 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 grind through their families on the way up, but they've got. I'm gonna hit a hundred million dollars, and I found out. You know what? You could be really, really happy with a $15, $20 million company with happy employees and a good bottom line and a happy family. Life is really good. So while there are people with much bigger businesses than mine, I don't know if they're any happier. And that was an albatross I had to get rid of that was with me for probably 15 or 20 years. You learned some of this the hard way at one point. You I had... learned all of this the hard way. <laughs> Nothing was the easy way. Well, this in particular, you did have a big idea at one point that you thought might be your big business. Yeah, part of my um, revelation, I was in, just like the guy said, I was 49, 50. First of all, my mother died. I don't know that you grow up until your parent dies or both of your parents. I don't know that you really understand that you're going to die. 
I don't know that you really get it. So that was one piece. The second piece was I had this idea, I'm going to tie up all the frame shops in America and advertise together in, in, sh in magazines like Met Home and all those shelter magazines are called and put ads in there. Go to your local Framer Select member and I was going to sign up 500 frame shops paying yearly dues for it and use that new thing called the internet. They can go right on there, put in Frame Shop Chicago and it'll come up. And was convinced this was the greatest idea ever and, and, and was doing everything I never did. New concept using technology. I really thought I finally had the big one. So I did that for a few years, which was about two years too long, and I, I burned through hundreds of thousands of dollars and then woke up one day like a drunk in jail on Saturday morning thinking, what did I do? And I realized I'm an entrepreneurial -aholic. And I mean that in the most sincere way. I, I was just intoxicated by the whole entrepreneurship thing and the money thing. And I am now a recovering entrepreneurial holic, which is why I do things like this. It's like, for me, this is like going to an AA meeting. Um, <laughs> I, and I mean it. I, I, I went through the money, uh, parents died, and then lastly, I looked at my balance sheet and I realized like, hey, I did okay. I'm doing okay. Like, I don't need to end up with the next big idea. Like. I can buy anything I pretty much want. I'm not going to buy a Learjet or anything, but for in practical purposes, like life is good. And I'm telling you, when I had that revelation, I am much happier now that I got that thing off my back of I'm not doing. And I met someone yesterday that tr I told him to his face, I saw me 20 years ago. I want to do the best I can do. And I, they're, gonna, they're paying the price for it already, which I won't get into the details, but I tried to convince them that you should think about this. We talk about strategy all the time. How about the strategy of just being a healthy, happy, well-adjusted human being with happy customers, happy employees, and a happy family? How about that part of the strategy and just that of, I want to hit a hundred million. They talk, if you ever talk to any of these people that say that, and there's probably some of you in the audience, it's like a trance, like, I'm going to hit a hundred million dollars. <laughs> At what cost? One of the things people don't always think about in terms of growth is just how time consuming it is to hire to support that growth. The, you know, the time it takes to talk, I mean, it's, say you have uh, a company growing at 20%. What, is, what are the economics? Well, here's the math. You've got 100 employees, you're growing at 20%, which is a fast growth. I mean, I'm really happy growing 8% a year. 20% growth, is, it, once you get past 5 or $10 million, that's fast growth. I mean, Clay yesterday said he grew, you know, IAMS at 16% a year annually. I mean, 20% is a fast growth. If you have 100 employees, how many people do you have to hire? Well, if you're growing 20%, you'd figure, well, probably another 22, but that's not the case. You're gonna have some turnover. That's another 10 or 15. Okay, that's 30. Some of the ones you hire aren't gonna work out. Well, that's 40. Well, if you gotta interview five, 10 people, you're interviewing three, four hundred people a year. It's like a regular ongoing, you are onboarding someone every single week. And, and that's a lot of work and a lot of stress and a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of overhead. And I don't know that people figure that into their formula. It's very hard to make money when you're growing that fast. Do you still worry about going broke? Um, no, but I wouldn't have said that probably six years ago. I'm finally to the point now, and I will tell you a, a beautiful thing, real estate. I bought the real estate I'm in over the years. The SBA loan's the greatest thing ever. You put down 10%, and it's a great, great program. And I bought the real estate, and the fact is, even if the business, for whatever reason, went out, you know, I, I've got real estate now. So maybe somebody would call that diversification. But if you're your own tenant, it's a beautiful thing. So no, I don't, I don't really worry about that anymore. You have bank loans. Yeah, I have bank loan. Doesn't phase me, never has. Um, do, you still this, use, do you still use your house as collateral? Absolutely, and I will tell you why. I've gone in my head about, oh, should I just pay the house off? Would I sleep better? Using your house as collateral is very cheap money. I mean, I can't justify, if you take a line on your house, you could probably get a 2.5% loan, and if you go to the bank for a business loan, it's five, five and a half. I can't justify blowing th the three-point spread just so that I can say to myself, my house is paid off. It, it, I've gotten over that. I'm, I'm perfectly okay with using my house as collateral. I'm not going broke, I'm not gonna lose my house, and, and the banks just look at houses as really good collateral, and you can get a much cheaper loan that way. Does your wife know you use your house as collateral? <laughs> Um, you know, the, the government actually has come up with some guidelines I followed for what I 
tell my wife when I don't. And it's called the Miranda rights. Everything you say can and will be used against you. Um, I learned many, many years ago that she'll say, why are you staying late? Well, I hired this new manager. He's really going to help out. And then two months later, I'll be staying late again. What happened to that manager? I thought you were going to be coming home earlier. And I, and I realized, I want to keep her expectations real low. <laughs> You know, so I, 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 you know, now I use the don't ask, don't tell. I tell her whatever she wants to know. She, she probably knows. She knows we have a credit line in the house. I don't keep secrets from her, but I don't come home and all know everything on her. There's just no point. Um, she raised three boys. She had plenty to do with that. Now she's dealing with her ailing mother. I don't need to spread. It doesn't make me feel any better when I go unload anything on her. So I just decided that... I certainly don't keep secrets, but um, she probably knows most of it, but she doesn't ask, I don't talk about it. It's my, I tell you, I'm driving the car. It's okay. Do you consider your business a family business? Not sure. Working on that. Got two kids that are in it. One wants to leave. I said, you know, he wants to get an MBA. The other one, um, I'm not sure. Um, it certainly isn't a family business in the traditional sense that my kids work there growing up because, you know, we live in the suburbs of businesses in the city, and these days the kids are in so many other activities, they didn't, I can't say they worked like I did in my father's store. I'm not sure. Ask me in five years. I suspect that means you don't really have an exit plan, do you? I'm working on it. Um, I plan on working. I, one of the kids might take it over. I've got some key managers I'm working on. I don't have the, I, I will tell you that I'm not That would being, be no. No. I, I, well, I, I'm working on it. I, I'm, I'm 57. I don't know that I need, I, I'm working on it. I would say this, and I mean this with all sincerity. I got a lot of life insurance. And it gives a little wiggle room that if something happened, no one's going to be with a gun to their head, quick, sell the business, we need the cash. And I think that was a smart strategy, and I'm, I'm glad I have it. And, and if something happened, my wife and ad adult children could rationally sit down and figure, okay, should we give it a few years and see if the staff can run it, or should we, s at least there's no emergency thing. I, I feel much better knowing I have life insurance. What's it like having your two sons uh, in the office with you? You know, I, I, for years, I've got two little voices in my head. You know, one is, go ahead, do it, spend the money, buy that. And then the other half of me is going, that didn't work out so well last time. Maybe you shouldn't spend the money. Maybe that's not a good idea. And I don't have to have those arguments in my head anymore. I have my two kids having the arguments because one of them is, is like I was when I was 24. And you know, all he wants to do is you know, expand and jump into new things. And the other one is much more careful and much more deliberate and much more analytical. And, and I like having them there. I, I, you know, I can help them parse through all the issues. And, um, and I, I feel good that whether they're there or they're not, they're getting an education in business. And, um, um, we'll see in the next few years how that goes. I'm going to open this up to uh, questions from you guys in a moment, so please be thinking about that. Um, before I do, is, is there anything uh, keeping you awake at night these days? You know, that's a funny phrase, and it's really a serious phrase, because when you're in business, you could not sleep at night. And intellectually, I have a problem now with the bank. I intellectually, I'm fine, but I put my real estate into what's called a, a commercial mortgage, where they put it with an insurance company, because my bankers, my accountant said, oh, give it to a commercial broker, that way um, you'll get a longer term, because the bank only gives you five terms. If you put it with an insurance company, they give you a 10-year term. So I did it, I didn't think anything of it. Well, I'm in the ninth year of a 10-year term, and I could use some cash now for some more inventory. You know, the polar vortex business has been bad the last couple months in Chicago. I could use a little more cash. And I found out, much to my surprise, I can't borrow against the buildings because it's prohibitive in this, th the agreement I have with the insurance company. And yeah, that frustrates me. And I didn't sleep for a couple nights. I'm not worried about it, but it's frustrating. And it may, but I, I'm sleeping pretty well generally. I, I, I've got the business under control. This is, I wrote at the blog about it, as you know, this, this week. It's just frustrating that, here's a lesson. Here's my last big lesson. Don't assume your accountants know everything because that was just bad advice. And my, I pay my accountant a lot of money, and you know, and he's very smart and he's an excellent accountant. But that was a bad call. And even if I knew, which maybe I did, I don't remember. It's just I would never tell an entrepreneur tie your major asset up for 10 years and you can't get to it. I would never do that. And the lesson is, accounts. I can't make this clear enough. Accountants are not entrepreneurs. They're usually conservative and. The advice, I certainly would hear it, but they're not always right. And here's a case of that little stupid decision that would have been just as easy to do with the bank is causing me some grief now for the next year. The penalty to get out, you might say to yourself, why don't you just pay the mortgage off and remortgage? 
$138,000. That's the penalty. It's basically paying all the interest. This is why insurance companies have big buildings in all the downtowns of all of the... The fact is, insurance companies are great for huge loans for, for, for people that are building $50 million buildings. A smaller loan is not worth doing it. Let's open it up. Anybody got a question? Just, just promise me you won't ask Jay to explain what a hashtag is. <laughs> Anything else is fair game. What separates a 9 from a 10 as an employee in your mind? Um, in my mind, a 10 is like, you can't think of anything that they could be better at. They're just, they're, they're great. They're great at everything. A 9 is, you know, there's one part they could be better at, but believe me, I would be thrilled to have all 9s. Anybody struggling with management there? Have you grown by acquisition? Um, that's funny you ask, because just yesterday I got a call from someone who they're trying to sell their business and I might buy that, but up till now, no. Nor have you ever taken any investment money, right? I have never, everybody always talks about taking an investment, Campbell. Here's what I figured out. I don't have to really answer to anybody. And that's just, for me, that's just a beautiful thing. I have to answer to my customers, I have to answer to my employees, I have to answer to my wife. I'm still married, 35 years. <laughs> I just don't want to have to answer to anybody, so it's not worth it. Yes? Do you believe in investing in employees as far as the ones that have potential to um, get the management classes or Absolutely. Do I believe like in, that? I don't think that mic's working. Do, do I believe in, in investing in employees with class? Absolutely. I think it's a great thing to send them for classes and get them training because the smarter they get at work, the better it is for the company and it's a good investment. Any of you struggling with employee issues? Any of you struggling with being a manager? Um, as far as, is there, a, is there a rule or what's your rule on hiring friends? The rule on hiring friends, I think the rule I'd say is, are they the best qualified person for the job? Probably not. I call that accidental hiring. Every time I talk to an entrepreneur that's having a management problem, I go, wait, wait, let me go back a little bit. How did you hire this person? Every time. It's, well, he's my neighbor's brother-in-law, or he's my roommate from college sister, or something. It's accidental hiring. It is unlikely your friend is the best qualified person. And if you do hire your friend, you better be prepared to lose the friend, because there's a good chance that's going to happen. So um, I say, if you can't fire him, don't hire him. That would be my rule. Tweetable. <laughs> All right, we got it. OK. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming to Dayton, Ohio, by the way. Um, employee benefits, health insurance. What are you currently doing now? Where do you see your crystal ball heading in a year from now? 100, Big sigh. 100 employees plus dependents. Um, Big sigh. I just changed, took a $40,000 hit. Insurance rates, you know, I went from, I was with Humana, now we're going back to Blue Cross. Is it because Blue Cross is such a good deal? No, Humana just jacked up their prices so much that I was able to go back to Blue Cross. Uh, here's the bad news, good news. It went up 40 grand, which is a lot. I looked at the percentage, what it's costing me on payroll. It's like 5%. And like, you know what? If healthcare is better in America now because of it, I'm okay with that. Um, so it's, it's always been a problem, but it's 5% of my payroll. And uh, it's hard on my employees. You know, I'm paying more than half for the individuals, but the family people got problems. It's a big problem. So it's a problem. And I would say it's not just a problem for the business owner, it's a big problem with the, for the employees. Um, I'm gonna be doing a post in the next few weeks about disability insurance. I think that's worth looking at for companies, for people that, you know, for, for disability, because that's more likely than, you know, death. And so it's an ongoing, you know, problem. And the reason you would be interested in the disability insurance is because of the Yeah, here's what I think is funny. People say, oh, my people are my greatest asset. They're, my, they're like family. And I always ask them, do you have disability insurance? No. What do you do with that person that's been working with you for 15 years that gets sick, that might not be able to come back to work? When are you going to tell them you're not paying them anymore? Yikes. I don't want to be in that situation. And I will tell you, disability insurance is relatively cheap. So I'm absolutely, I have it now, and I'm looking into different policies. But, um, and I did not, I looked at the, at the Affordable Care Act. It's not worth messing with. I, I kept the insurance. It just, that, it, it. I, I personally believe if you own a business and you care about your employees, you're providing health insurance, period. Figure out how to pay for it. In the interviewing process when you're hiring, uh, do you do any kind of assessments? 
I've gone on and off with that. We used to give assessments. We stopped giving assessments. Now I think we're back. We're giving. We're doing assessment. I think they can be valuable. I will tell you one thing. My I now have an HR person. You know, I've got 110 employees. When you hit 100 or so, they say you should have an HR. And, and it worked out exactly the case. It's worth having an HR person for me. She tested out four of those companies. She took the test herself. She's been with me for four years. I know her well. It was a little startling and disturbing. A couple of them were right on the money. And one of them made her sound like she was an axe murderer. <laughs> and I said to myself, people are buying this test and using it for hiring decisions. And this thing was so far off base, it was horrifying. So I would say to you, if you're thinking of using testing, which might be, test them on your own employees and make sure they're good ones because some of them are really solid. Some of them are amazing. I mean, you, wow, I mean, that's really accurate. And some of them aren't at all amazing. So uh, I think they're good ideas. I don't know the name of the one we're using right now. If you want to email me, I'll email you back. So how big a factor would that be in hiring someone? That's where I, see, that's the question. Did I not hire someone because of it? Maybe occasionally. It's a factor, but not, if somebody said, ah, I don't like using them, it's too, I'm in between on it. I, you know, I think one thing they're good for is if you do hire the person, at least you know what you're getting. We just used one on a woman, and it said she's overly sensitive. And we asked her on the, after the interview, this says, you're, oh, no, that's not true. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's been with me for six weeks. She's sensitive. I, I, have, to, <laughs> I, I have to work, I, I, you know, and I, I have to work with it. But I know that, and I'm dealing with it. But at least it lets you know a little bit. I, had one, I gave a test years ago to one, and it said, I said, she was with me for a couple of years. She says, uh, I said, what do you think of the results? I think it was all accurate, except the one part really bothers me. It says I'm too sensitive to criticism. And she's the defensive person I'm talking about. She was gone soon after. Like, everything you said to her was always this whole defense thing. So I think they have a place. I want to thank you guys uh, for coming in. I don't think it's a point. Uh, but I've got a, a question about the transition that you make from going from working in the business to working on the business. And where do you draw that line at? And when do you stop being the technician and start being the well, I think it depends on your business. If he, the question is, when do you stop working in your business and go on your business, and when do you stop being the technician? At some point, I would think you've hired people, and I've heard CEOs go, oh, I hire people smarter than me, and I used to think to myself, oh, that's a nice line, but I don't buy it. I, I, now I understand what that means. I would say that the people in my company that are doing their jobs that are in car, they are better at what they're doing than I am. My salesperson's better than I am is better than a salesperson. My accountant's better than I am at, at an accountant. And that once you finally staff properly and you have the right people in the positions, I would think you could work on the business. But because at some point you should be hiring competent people. And I would say, and even in companies been around for 30 years, they still have the six problem. And, and I, I do speeches, you know, six, ten times a year, and people come up to me and they go, that was really insightful, thanks. You know, I, you're talking about someone that works for me. I know i got to do something, and I haven't. They've been doing it for 30 years, though. So even in established companies, there's people that can't do the job. And, and I would say this, you're not a manager until you've had to fire someone you don't like. You can call yourself a manager, but until you've had to go through that trauma, you're not really a manager. You're a good manager when you learn how to fire someone you do like. Those are the harder ones because you might like them, but they just can't do the job. And I am telling you, without any question in talking to entrepreneurs over the years, that is still the number one problem. They rationalize it, and the reason they keep getting pulled back into the company is because they don't have competent people. So my argument is, if you have competent people in all the right positions, you should be able to work on the business. You mentioned something about having a salesperson who's better than you are. Do you have, is this an outside salesperson? Yes, and, and I'll tell you what I've been struggling with for four years. I'm a retailer in my blood, 30 years, and I got into the, I'm selling corporate art now. They have to go out, call on companies and sell them our work, and they're outside salespeople, and I just use the same old thing I learned in retail. Hire nice people, tell them what do they do it doesn't quite work with outside salespeople. Um, and, and since this building was you know, built from the money from IMES, I'll use this analogy. Dogs and cats, similar, right? Four legs, furry, they're your pets. But they're not the same. Does anyone have both? I've had both. There's a difference between a dog and a cat. Would you give me that? Big difference, okay. Dog, friendly, always there, reliable, man's best friend. Cats? Not always the case. Sometimes they're your best friends, sometimes they want nothing to do with you. But here's the difference. Cats will go out and they'll kill things. 
and they'll bring them back and they'll go up trees. They're hunters. They go out and they find things and they kill them. Dogs. <laughs> they don't do any of that stuff. And I learned that outside salespeople are like cats and inside people are, are like dogs. And you can't manage them the same way. So I've learned that at the end of the day, that nice person you hired that shows up every day on time, if they can't sell anything, they're useless. And I've been through numerous ones. So now I've learned, is it harder to manage dogs? You can't manage a cat. Does anyone figure that out? There's a reason why that phrase, herding cats. It's a different animal. So I've learned, I hire them, and I try to tell them what to do, and I try to get them to do the right things, and it's a constant management thing. But I've accepted the reality that they do what they do, and that's how they do it, and I've had to adapt my brain, but it's taken three, four years for me to finally get my arms around that, and that was a whole new thing. I, it's, it's a whole different business. Anybody else? A question around the culture. Um, of course, how can we have a conversation in business in 2014 without talking about corporate culture? I'm just wondering, uh, one, how many locations and then how you keep your company culture uh, connected through across multiple locations? First of all, most of my locations are on the same. I've got the framing business on the same block next to the home store, the art business is upstairs, and then I have a factory you know, a mile and a half away and I have one suburban store. Um, I think the word corporate culture has been perverted to a degree that I cringe when I read about these companies and magazines, which it, these days a lot of people think corporate culture is uh, ping pong tables and bring your dog to work day and, <laughs> and hat, funny hat day. And I define corporate culture as what do you expect from your employees? Do you expect them to work 80 hours a week, 40 hours a week, something? How far are you going for customers? Are you delivering it to them? Are you going to work at night till 10 o'clock to get it done? Um, what do you expect in an environment? I come to the conclusion, I don't want jerks working for me. I expect respectful behavior at work. I don't expect my managers to be yelling at people. If someone needs to be yelled at, I would argue, call them in the office privately and calmly fire them. I don't, I don't get into that whole yelling thing. And lastly, and I added this one because of the Great Recession. You know, I'm in the home furnishing industry. We took a big hit, 2008, 2009. Um, what is your corporate culture for profits? Some companies are okay making a 2% profit. Some companies apparently are okay making no profit. What are your expectations for making profit? And I believe that through our actions and our regular meetings, our corporate culture is solid and everyone knows why we're there and, and how we operate. And I haven't had a problem with that. Um, I, I this, it, like I said, the corporate culture thing, I, I think is, it's, 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 unfortunately corporate culture is disconnected from performance and in my world, Corporate culture means what do we have to do to take care of customers, have happy employees that hang around, and make a bottom line. To me, that's what corporate culture drives. And in my case, like I said, my, my average employee's been with me nine, 10 years, and we have very low turnover, and people like to come to work, and it's a respectful environment. That's my corporate culture. And we live it. We, you know, uh, my managers all know it, and we have regular meetings on. And here's a symptom of a, pro a company that's struggling when they say, oh, we don't have time for meetings. That's a huge problem. You can't not have time for meetings. You have to have every one of my employees is in a meeting once a week. It might be for 10 minutes. The factory, every Friday at 10 o'clock, we have a quick, here's what we're doing, here's what went right, here's what went wrong. Uh, the salespeople, every single person is in some kind of meeting once a week. And I think that's critical to keeping the quote unquote corporate culture going in the right direction. How much financial information do you share with your employees? Um, the managers, pretty much most of it. The you know, hourly employees, we tell them how we're doing, we give them an idea, but I, I, you know, they don't see everything. But I, we're fairly open with it. But I think, again, that's another fun phrase. Oh, we're completely transparent. Really? I, I don't, that doesn't make any sense to I me. Mean, I, I, I'm all for transparency, but complete transparency, no. And, and I would tell you, when things are bad, I tell them, listen, we're down business, we're losing money. I'm honest with them, but I tell them, here's what we're doing about it, and here's what we need to do. And, and I, I call that a collaborative environment, an open environment. My employees know where we're at and where we're going and how we're doing, and I think that's important. Anybody else? Sorry. Um, how about on compensation of uh, your headhunters? Are they base plus uh, commission, or do you, uh, you have more? Which job are you talking about? Your salespeople. The salespeople. The question is, do I have my commission or not? Um, 
my inside sales people get an hourly and then they get a percentage over a certain base amount they have to sell. So there's some months they get no commission if it's really slow. Outside salespeople, I've got a base and some commission. Part art, part science. Well worth putting some energy into because it's, it's, you know, there's people I hire for outside sales now. I'm some, paying some people, you know, a really good starting salary because I've concluded I can't hire kids anymore. I can't hire the 24 year old that goes, oh, I really love art and you know, my mother's an art. They don't understand the outside sales thing. I don't have the training for it. They don't have connections with the design firms. So I'm hiring people that have more experience and I'm paying a bigger base with a smaller percentage. But, I, but at the end of the day, here's how it works. If they sell a certain amount, they all make the exact same thing. So some of a bigger base, smaller percentage, some of a smaller base, bigger percentage, but it's some number they all make the exact same thing, so it, it works, I think. And, uh, but like I said, part art, part science, um, it's, it's worth looking a lot at that. I have one last question for you. Excellent. We, we've heard how much you've learned in your uh, 35 years. We know you've progressed a lot. You, we, you don't have the $100 million company, but you have a very and that's successful okay. company. Yeah. And that's okay. Uh, but I also happen to know that it's still possible for you to struggle with some things as seemingly elementary as delegation. Could you tell us I'll a little bit you about my, your struggle with that? My delegation story, which really summarizes my whole business career. I um, was in business for about three, four years. I'm struggling with the whole delegation thing, growing fast, and I keep reading books and going to seminars, and they keep hearing delegation, delegation, delegation. So in Chicago, I don't know what it is here, you get a vehicle sticker every year. You have to put it on your windshield. You pay for it, it goes on your windshield. January 1st, you had to put a new sticker on. And I thought to myself, that's the kind of thing I should delegate. So I get one of my guys and I say, here, um, here's the vehicle sticker where you put it on the car. And okay, no problem. It's always the beginning of every problem. No problem. <laughs> so puts the sticker on. I'm feeling good about myself. Look at me. I'm like a manager. I'm delegating now. Get in the car that night and the sticker's like in the middle of the windshield, crooked. You can't get them off. And like, I have to look at it for an entire year now about what an idiot I am. I should have done it myself maybe. And this delegation thing's not so hot after all. Okay, so it's a year later. But I've grown a lot over the year and I figured out I didn't get it. You can't just delegate. You've got to give instructions. So this year I'm smarter. I've got it all down pat. Now I've got the car and the van. I said, okay, put the two stickers on. One inch from the bottom, one inch from the side. Here's a razor blade, here's a paper towel. Put the paper towel on the dashboard, scrape it off. I'm a manager and I'm feeling good about myself about this one. Send them off. I don't know, half an hour later he comes back. Do you get it done? Yeah. Yeah? Well, I got them on, but I lost the razor blade. What? Yeah, I, I can't find the razor blade. What, I'm like going to sit down on the razor blade? Are my kids going to sit down on the razor blade? Yeah, I couldn't find the razor blade. Great. So for the next year, instead of staring at the sticker in the wrong place, I'm always looking for the razor blade. Okay, we're on year three now. I didn't get it last year. Now I've got it. Delegation, instructions, follow-up. I'm a manager now. Now I've got more. Now I figured it out. So I said, okay, it's really cold out this year too. So it's it was even better that I was delegating this task. Really cold out, I said, okay, here's sticker one, because I know what they're going to do this year. They're going to flip the stickers and put it on the wrong vehicle. Going to beat that one, though, because I'm a manager now. Here, put the sticker on. One in same instructions. When you're done with that, you come back, and I'll give you the second sticker. I'm a manager. Okay, he comes back. He hands me the old sticker in one piece. Oh my God, I've never been able to get them off in one piece. I'm like some kind of management savant. I've, I've gone from inexperienced to like, now I'm a pro. I'm feeling great about myself. Great, here's the other sticker. He goes out, I don't know, half an hour goes by. I think, boy, it's taking a long time to get that sticker on. I go looking for him and I see him coming out of the bathroom, white as a ghost. Do you get the sticker on? No, why not? I broke the windshield. He used a blowtorch on it to get the, it was zero degrees out. He put a blowtorch on. That's how he got the first sticker off in one piece. And he put it on my Lincoln Continental. It was my first nice car. He put it on the car. Boom! The whole windshield just exploded. Um, and he was in the bathroom vomiting. Literally. He was, you, you just blew up the boss's windshield putting a sticker on. And my vice president was standing next to me and he goes, I saw him walking by with the blowtorch and I wondered where he was going. 
<laughs> so there's a couple lessons there. When one of your employees is walking around with a blowtorch, ask them where they're going. Okay. Now it's year four. <laughs> do I get back on the horse and do this? No. No. I've been putting the stickers on for the last 20 years, and I like doing it, and now I've got eight vehicles, but it's okay. I check to make sure the registration is in there. It's okay. And Chicago moved the sticker thing to June because they knew it was hard to do it. So it's not bad. It's summer. I go out there. So there is a, a follow-up to this story, though. Last year, I've been doing it for literally 20 years now. My person who's been with me for 20 years, the sticker's sitting on the desk, and she has a company car, and I said, oh, I'll put the sticker on tomorrow. She goes, you know what? You don't need to put it on. I can put it on. You know, it's got the plastic cover on it. You've got to take it off. It's a paint. You don't need to do it. No, no, Jay, I can handle this. I'll put the sticker on. So I stare at the sticker. I look at her. I stare at the sticker. I look at her. Okay, fine, put the sticker on. I feel, all right, it's been 20 years, I've paid enough for this. <sighs> we have a big parking lot, I drive it in the morning, I park, she's there before me, I walk by her car, I look down at the license plate. The sticker's in the top left corner instead of the top right corner. And I just feel like in the movies, I just wanna go, no! I walk into her office, she's sitting there, and I just, and she goes, I know! I was putting the sticker on, I had the plastic cover off, I was trying to get the old stickers off, and George, our delivery guy's walking by, and she goes, boy, these are hard to get off, and he goes, no problem, you can put it in any corner, and before I could grab him, he took the sticker from the ground, and he stuck it in the top left-hand corner. <laughs> so, my other guy got it off with a blow, with a, with a hot gun, <laughs> with a hot air gun, and he got it off, but I did find out one more thing. The guy who helped move it is the same guy who lost the razor blade 25 years ago. <laughs> And he admitted to me 25 years later, yeah, I didn't really lose the blade. I dropped it down the air conditioning vent. <laughs> so he, but he didn't want to tell me. So there's another lesson that employees don't always want to tell you when they screw it up. But I did find out 25 years later. There's someone driving around in a 1984 Lincoln Continental now with a razor blade in the air conditioning vent. They can't figure out which rattling. So that's my, uh, so what am I doing today? I'm putting the stickers on. <laughs> and I like putting the stickers on. It's okay. It's a little it's outside. It's fresh air. So the, 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 the true lesson of the story is when you delegate stuff, stuff's going to get screwed up once in a while, but it's still better than doing it all yourself. As long as it's something you can fix, it's okay. If you delegate 20 tasks and one goes not the right way, so what? You can fix it. Can you really afford to do all 21 things? And the answer is no, you can't. Thank you, Jay. Okay, thanks for having Jay us. Jay Goltz. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you again to Lauren and Jay. Very, very Thanks much. for having thank us. You. Thank you.